menstrual blood. Like all the men would just sort of like, <laughs> just like hold on for dear life. I think that that conversation is now more out in the open. I think perimenopause and menopause, like I said, is definitely having a moment. I think that, you know, the women that came before us had to sort of suffer in silence, like the hot flashes and it's just like suck it up buttercup. And this is just, you know, what, what happens when you're aging and we're seeing more and more women really embrace aging well. But I also very strongly believe that it is such a privilege to age. I've born this a little bit from Peter Atia. I think he calls it the Centenarian Olympics. Mm. Where he's like, what do I want to do as a centenarian? What are the things when I'm 100? And so I've taken that because I love that concept. And I think about what is it going to mean for me to be like a kick-ass grandmother? Hopefully I'm getting wiser and I'm starting to think a little bit about what the real meaning of life is. And for me, that's, you know, family is very important to me. And I was talking to my husband and we came up with this term offensive joy. Mm. And often when we think about offensive, usually it's like something that's like an insult mm -hmm. or something is offensive to you. But if you think about it in a sports context, there's offense and there's defense, right? So when you're mm. on the offense, you're being proactive about something. And I think for women in perimenopause, as I am, or in menopause, it's in some ways it's a second spring. It's a way for us to reevaluate. We've spent many decades serving other, we've been mothers to children and wiping mm -hmm. up the snot and taking them to soccer and all the things. And it's a, it's a, time of our lives where we can get back to who we are. Mm. So understanding what are some of the things that really bring me joy, like affect, like how can I be proactive in creating joy and pleasure in my life? Because I think that so many women, maybe your aunt feels this way where she's stressed, like there's so much chronic stress. And it's like, is it that you're, you're stressed because you're doing too much or is it because you're not doing enough of what you love mm. and you're not balancing out the, the, you know, the need, the have to do's and the get to do's. Dr. Estima, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to be here. This I'm is awesome. We're doing this. So I met you, um, I was on your show yeah. and we totally hit it off. Um, I loved the way you were doing the interview, the questions you had, the conversation we had. Then I looked at your content and I thought it was phenomenal. Um, so I wanted you to come on our show so we can introduce you to our audience. Those people who don't know who you are. Introduce yourself first, kind of tell us about your background and then there's some some stuff I'd love to ask you. Sure, yeah. So first, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and you're, you've are you been on the show twice. Mm -hmm. The first time you came on, I think it's still in our top 10. I think it hovers around four or five. I have to wow. check the number. Yeah, so mm -hmm. really I don't like not being number one. Wish you'd yeah. good for that. I wish you'd do <laughs> yeah. good for us like that. Yeah, so my, my background, uh, I'm trained as a chiropractor. Uh, I did my undergrad in neuroscience science and psychology. And so I've always just had this love affair with the brain and the neuromuscular skeletal system uh, in private practice for 19 years before retiring it and moving more uh, into the online space. And I focus now on women's health because even when I was in clinical practice, really noticed we would run nutrition programs and physical fitness programs. Uh, we'd run stress management programs, the whole gamut. And would notice a very different prognosis, even in a husband and wife. So same environment, they're living in the same home, they're oh, eating the same foods, and they would have different um, results, let's say, if they were uh, following a certain protocol, a certain diet together. Um, we, I think may, it was maybe 2016, 2017, we had started trying a ketogenic diet, so more of a pulling back on the carbohydrates, uh, moderate protein, a higher fat uh, diet. And we would have men coming in after two weeks saying, Doc, I feel great. I've lost 20 pounds. I've, you know, my libido's back. I'm sleeping, uh, you know, the way that I did, what, you know, 20 years ago. And then the woman, the wife would sort of be dragging her feet, you know, behind him saying mm. like, I've lost maybe a pound. We're eating literally the same things. Um, so that was sort of my first clue in terms of looking at how we can uh, modulate dietary interventions for men and women and how those might be different. Um, certainly my um, thinking around keto has evolved uh, quite significantly, significantly, particularly in the perimenopausal and, men and menopausal space, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. Um, but that was sort of the beginning. And my own story, you know, my own personal struggles with my menstrual cycle for years, I always would look to men in the fitness space and sort of try and copy what they were doing and never really had the same results for myself. So my own sort of N of one 
and then my patients in, in clinic over you know the the 19 year tenure that I was that I was uh, practicing sort of led me to really focusing on female health because I think that it's I, I think it's getting better in terms of the amount of uh, the conversations that were happen that are happening now I think perimenopause and menopause are sort of having a bit of a moment which is lovely and I still think that there's a lot of uh, gaps in uh, women's health care um, that I would like to that I'd like to seal. Why, awesome. do, why do you think that that is? Why do you think women kind of got left behind on the conversation? Why did we focus so much on men or what's your opinion? Um, I think that it's a combination of things. I think first, w when we look at the literature, so any clinician worth their salt is going to combine, you know, when we think about evidence-based medicine, we're going to be thinking about what's available in the literature. We're going to combine that with our own clinical experience and the desires of the patient, right? So if we sort of think of those three circles overlapping, uh, an overlapping Venn diagram, let's yeah. say, the literature is very much lacking. It's getting better now, but it's very much lacking in terms of female specific content. And if you look at a lot of the uh, literature up until about 2017, it was usually you know, university guys signing up for a study because they were broke and they needed, you know, mm -hmm. money, yeah. you know, <laughs> kind of to, to, to uh, you know, to fund uh, their university life. And so we have a lot of data uh, that is titrated, sort of looking at women as maybe, you know, a smaller archetype of a man with just pesky hormones. We sort of never really considered this idea that a woman is really different yeah. every single week and and really every single day of her, of her, of, of her month. Um, and so I think that there's a gap in the literature and then that translates to sort of a gap in clinical expertise because you're drawing on the literature yeah. and you're trying to play with it a little bit and that takes a little bit of time. So I think that I don't know that it it's malintent. Um, certainly I, I know of online doctors in the online space who I just feel are filled with vitriol and, and uh, don't listen to women when they speak up and tell their stories and they're dismissed. And I'm sure that that happens in in clinical practice as well. So I think that it, I think it's a combination of those things. It's a lack of the literature, which is now getting better. I think in 2017, the NIH mandated that women be, you know, you can't exclude a woman because she has a menstrual cycle, because that used to be considered a confounding variable. Wow. So you can't do that anymore. It, yeah. It seems so ironic to me because if you were to just randomly pick 10 men, 10 women and ask who's more likely to even go to the doctor. I'm imagining that women are even more likely to go and, and talk to a doctor. So it's yeah. weird that we would not, we'd exclude them in so many studies and stuff. That's weird. Yeah. I, and I think that there's a bit of a societal uh, conditioning aspect to that as well. It's mm -hmm. more acceptable for a woman to ask for help versus, you know, sometimes you'll, mm -hmm. I, and I would see this a lot in practice where like the woman would be a patient first and then she would drag her husband sure. in. Mm -hmm. She's like, this guy's back. Like I can't deal with the back pain. <laughs> that he's still, I can't deal with him talking about the back pain anymore. So I think that there's a bit of a, there's some, uh, some cultural norms in there as well. Yeah. 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 You know, as trainers, um, we, we work with individuals, but you start to notice trends, um, you know, when it comes to men and women. The biggest ones that I initially noticed were really just in preferences, uh, types of workouts that they would, you know, gravitate towards things that they would want to do, not want to do. And yeah, <laughs> you know, um, so it was really around that. And I didn't notice big physiological general differences because I was always looking at the individual. So to me, it was always like, well, this is Mrs. Johnson. This is, you know, Mr. Smith or whatever. But I noticed that the first time was with fasting. Um, when fasting became kind of this popular thing, because when I first started in fitness in the late 90s, fasting was, that was like, like the weirdos fasted. Nobody fasted. Everybody right. eats every two hours. Right. Then fasting became a thing and everybody started trying it. And I remember there was a dramatic difference between how men and women fasted. I would have women that would fast and they'd come to me and be like, my hair's falling out. Why is my hair falling out? And I'm, all these like overstress symptoms, whereas the male clients I had didn't necessarily see that. And when I saw it enough times, I started wondering, I wonder if men and women generally have a different response to fasting mm. or to physical stress or to nutrition. Um, what are some of the big different general differences that you see when it comes to, I mean, you mentioned keto, for example. What are some of the big differences and then why, are they just hormone based? Is that where those differences come from? Yeah, I think this, I think it's a little bit of everything. Fasting is another area that I've changed my opinion on. And I think when fasting was sort of this premier topic in healthcare, uh, you saw a lot of women adop adopting the 16 hour, the OMADs, the every other yeah. day, you know, the 72 hour, the 96 hour fast. And um, 
I think what, again, coming back to this idea that women are just not smaller archetypes of men, uh, you would see women adopt almost these uh, maladaptive behaviors. So with keto, I saw this as well. So both keto and fasting, they would see a drop in water weight, right? You reduce your carbohydrates, you're going to drop water weight, yes. right? So uh, people would feel better on it. And, and that's, that's all great. Uh, maybe you're, in, you know, sensitizing mm. yourself to uh, insulin a little bit. But one of the things that I had trouble with, with the with the ketogenic diet and with fasting is actually moving them away from that therapeutic intervention. Like they just wanted to stay in keto land forever I see. to the point where you're, you know, where you're saying my hair is falling out. The, you know, the outer third of my eyebrow has, you know, has fallen out. So now we're starting to think, okay, is there any sort of thyroid issue that's coming in? And women are exquisitely more sensitive to nutrient intake than our male counterparts, especially in our fertile years, because we are, you know, your your the mitochondria in the uh, in the ovaries are constantly scanning the environment to see is this a safe environment oh. for her to become pregnant, irrespective of your desire to become pregnant. Your oocytes, like the 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 cells in the ovaries, are always looking: is this safe for her to become pregnant? And so, when you're fasting for seventy two hours or ninety six hours, or even if you're just fasting every single day, you don't eat until one p.m. Uh, you're not sending a safety signal. Uh, to the body. And you do see things like the hair loss. You start to see more anxiety. You start to see sleep dysregulation, mood and affect uh, changing as well. Uh, and then you also just, you know, the metabolic adaptations to reducing, to having, a, having an extreme and aggressive caloric restriction over time. I mean, you know, all, you know, we've, I, I was listening to, um, I listen to your podcast all the time and you've talked about bulks and cuts. Like there's only so far and so long you should be in a cut, right? Mm -hmm. In a caloric deficit. And of course the magnitude, the, um, the magnitude of the caloric deficit is also going to matter. Mm -hmm. If you are consistently under eating, your body is not stupid. Your body is going mm -hmm. to be adapting to the the substrate or lack thereof that you're giving it. So you're going to dial down your BMR. You're going to dial down. Your digestion is going to slow down because your body now is trying to extract every single molecule of, molecule of food that you might put into it. Um, so you're going to see all of these different adaptations um, for women. And so I... Where I stand on fasting now is we fat all of us fat, men and women we all fast every night right so mm -hmm. we all sleep hopefully somewhere between eight and nine hours. If you want to extend your fast, if you feel good when you're fasting, if you're someone who is still in their fertile years, so you're still menstruating regularly, uh, you might be more uh, receptive to a longer fast in the first half of your cycle. So that would be in the follicular phase, so bleed week, so the week that you have your period, and then the week before you ovulate. But even then... Um, I would say, for, I mean, I can say for me personally, I don't really fast more than 12, 13 hours mm -hmm. max, maximally. So I'm usually like 12 to 12, like I'll, you know, sleep and then, you know, maybe I'll wake up and I eat almost immediately upon waking. Um, and that's just a muscle preservation strategy as I'm in my uh, mid forties now. Uh, and I tend to finish eating like a couple hours before I go to sleep. Mm. Um, and that's how I I feel best doing that. And based on the stories that I have had with many women, when we are extending the fasting window for a long period of time, it's like, what, where are you going to go? You know, like wh how much longer are you going to fast? How much more aggressive are you going to try and use this as a tool for weight loss? Um, and I found, you know, I was saying before, I find the same is true with the ketogenic diet as well. Mm. They feel good. They lose the water weight. And then when it's time to reintroduce carbohydrates in the form of vegetables and fruits and sweet potatoes and rice and oats and all the things, they're deathly afraid of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. um, which I think in both cases can really lead to disordered eating. And women, I think, because of our culture, like always be skinny, always, you yeah. know, never mm -hmm. age and always look this way. Uh, I think that we are much more susceptible to that disordered relationship with food. Yeah. And, you know, you have... You one of the things I like about your perspective, you have a unique perspective because you have a great relationship with strength training. You've been strength training for a long time. You at one point competed um, as a figure competitor, which is uh, like a natural bodybuilder, essentially. Um, so you understand the benefits of it. But women, um, and you see this, it's less now than, than it was when I first started. It was really yeah. bad when I first started. Yeah. But still, they're so afraid of the scale 
They're afraid of the scale it's moving. It's the only in. metric in some yeah. cases that yeah. matters. Yeah, so I yeah. often tell people don't even weigh yourself because yeah. you could gain weight on the scale and get leaner. A lot of people don't realize that. 100%. As a percentage. You could uh, take creatine and gain weight on the scale. And you and you actually become leaner yeah. as a percentage yeah. uh, of your body weight. A lot of people don't, a lot of women don't realize it. And then they mm -hmm. look, muscles look rounder and fuller and mm -hmm. it's like that's what you want yeah but the scale is a big enemy enemy one of the things that i noticed and i love your opinion on this is um well first let me ask you this is your menstrual cycle is that a great um is that a sign you should really pay attention to uh, when it's starting to get off when you're skipping periods when um your period's longer than it normally is or it's not like you is that a great sign that maybe something's off 100 percent. hey sorry to interrupt look i have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off this guide is totally free we're giving it to everybody right now if you want it click on the link at the top of the description below all right back to the show yeah, okay. it is a vital sign for women. Okay. It is basically every month you get a hormonal report card. How well you manage your stress, what the balance of progesterone and estrogen was, every and you can you can look at the quality. I don't know if this is TMI. No, it's <laughs> so right. gonna get no, a no. crazy, but you know, you can it. look at your you can look at your uh blood uh and look at the qual like is it does it start very dark and then over the course of the week, does it sort of lighten up? Are, are, is there a lot of clots in the blood? If so, how big are they? Hmm. Uh, so you can really you can really extrapolate a lot of information from the blood in, in your bleed week in terms of, do you have too much estrogen? A lot of women who deal with uh, excess estrogen, you know, conditions like endometriosis, adenomyosis. Uh, I've cared for many of these women who, when we first started, and I would ask them about their the, their menstrual blood, it's like it's all clots. It's all it's mm. just all sort of clumpy. It's not liquid in any way. Um, so you can you can derive a lot of information from the menstrual cycle. That's interesting. Sure. Is are there common ones that women just tend to ignore when in relation to that? Like they just think that's normal. Like oh that's normal. We talked I, just recently. I know this is a terrible analogy, but hang with me. Of like you know people having like these disgusting farts that they do <laughs> and thinking that it's normal, right? right. Oh, it's just gas. But right. so it's like no, listen, that's your gut trying to tell you that's like <laughs> that's not a compliment yeah, the, to the yeah, chef. Yeah, the paint yeah. is not supposed to peel. <laughs> yeah. So are it like in, in the same regards? Is there similar things that women just go? Oh, I'm supposed to bleed or supposed to be like that? Like as far as the flow or the things yeah. that they ignore. Like length that, of the bleed is important. So for uh, you know, the, and there's there's de there's bio individuality here. So I'm going to talk about normal ranges, but of course there can be there can be uh, you know, there's Barrett. area for there's wiggle room, but typically a bleed somewhere between three and seven days is considered normal. Uh, like I mentioned, bleeding in the beginning, having a heavier flow in the beginning, and then having it um, taper off, lighten taper off towards the end of the week is very normal. The color of the blood should also change. So normal colors of the blood in the beginning, typically a very dark plum color, and then it should sort of taper off to more of a lighter color. You can even see some brown at the end. Um, that's usually just oxygen oxidized blood. It's just been like blood that's just been exposed to um, oxygen. Um, if it's, it, it usually should not have, um, if the, if the uh, color of the blood is orange or black or gray, you know, we could be looking at BV like bacterial vaginosis or some type of infection. Um, and then the clotting that I mentioned. So there should, you, some clotting is normal. I typically will tell women, you know, if it's about the size of a dime or smaller, that's considered normal. Uh, if it's a quarter or bigger, then this is where we start to think, okay, maybe there was unopposed estrogen in the second half of the cycle uh, where we should see sort of projection progesterone and estrogen they sort of I, I like to call progesterone she sort of brings in her like ninjas and like beats the crap out of estrogen <laughs> with their like down regulates the estrogen receptors down regulates estrogen production you should see that in the second half of the cycle so if there's a lot of clotting in the blood that tells me that there's unopposed estrogen in that time of Got your cycle. It. And yeah. in, are these like uh, sign now uh, are these signs of imbalances hormonally and stuff uh, early signs or does this mean this has probably been going on for a long time? Like can the will the body start to tell her that hey this is almost going on. immediately okay so that's why it's just a good metric yeah, yeah it's so it's so wonderful because you can really go from having terrible periods terrible PMS um, you know requiring medication to sort of get you through the second half of the cycle to within a couple of months really seeing that turnaround quite aggressively and I've seen that in, wow. in patients you know hundreds of times over so for women who exercise regularly <clears throat> who watch their diet and they start to notice these changes um, is it typically because they're doing too much? Overstressed? Is that what tends to be one of the common culprits? 
I think there's a lot of type A personalities, I'll call myself out on that mm. as well, where we are always concerned about achieving, 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 achieving. And you can also overdo it in the gym, right? Sure. So when last time you were on the show, I was saying, I, you know, you were talking about junk volume and I was like, oh damn, I feel so, I feel like I'm being called out here because I totally can move into that junk volume mm -hmm. territory because I really enjoy it. Uh, and I think that a lot of women can also get caught up in that. But I think that it's very hard for a woman I have, I've seen it, but I think it's more common for a woman to overdo it on the cardio side mm. than it is for her to overdo it on the sure. on the weight training side. I've often, whenever I've sort of evaluated a woman's strength training program, more often than not, if if strength and hypertrophy is the goal, she's usually not working out hard enough. Mm. Um, like lifting heavy. Yeah. She, it's either lifting heavy enough, she's not working close enough to failure. Like you don't need to, cer certainly uh, heavy weights is one way that you can that you can drive uh, muscle hypertrophy. As you know, I think for a lot of women, particularly these, you know, I'll use your your um, course name. You know, your muscle mommies, right? Yeah, that are yeah. like they've gone from the cardio bunny. Now they're like they want to be the muscle mommy um there's a lot of apprehension in terms of starting to lift heavy because now all you hear is like lift heavy weights lift heavy weights so a lot of women are really worried about getting injured you can still drive an incredible amount of muscle hypertrophy just by working them there's a couple of different ways so, so heavy weights is one of them but if you don't have the neuromuscular integrity if you don't have the motor patterns like you all know more than anyone exercise is a skill right it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a motor skill that you practice every time you're in the gym you practice it over and over and over again to become more sufficient and more proficient at it so women who train and i don't want to poo-poo on like women's magazines or anything but hmm. let's poo-poo on women's <laughs> magazines <a> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. it's like you often see them in a plank and they're doing a row. Yeah, it's like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now we have- Donkey your, kickbacks. And <laughs> right, but if you're in a plank with a row or like the, the uh, one I always see is- um, A squat press curl. Squat and a press. It's <laughs> yeah. like, that's working not- So the, the weight is neither going to be sufficient enough to work the legs because you're holding probably five, eight, mm -hmm. maybe 10 pounds. Like that's not sufficient enough for a squat for your leg muscles, some of the biggest muscles in the body, right? Mm. right? So you're maybe going to approximate failure with an overhead press with the shoulders but it's a waste of time. Yeah. So just do the barbell squat, do the front squat, do the sumo squat, whatever, get on the Smith machine if you want a predictable line of motion and work the muscle to one to three reps of muscle failure. I mean, you guys, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir, right? Like you don't mm -hmm. need to go. No, yeah, but it's so good to have yeah. you yeah. say it though. I know. Better, yeah. better when you say it than no, we I, say it. I want to know too, because I mean, the two hardest cells, and you're bringing one of them up, which is like to get women to kind of focus on lifting heavier and making that a priority. But the other one is to eat more and to be in a surplus and, yeah. and go through a phase of yeah. that even. And like, how hard is it for you to convince or even talk women into to doing that? It's hard. Even with the with the creatine, you know, the creatine, people are like, but aren't I, aren't I going to get bloated? It's like, no, the water is not the water is in the myocyte it's in the cell it's plumping up it's rounding out the yeah, that's it's how we rounding it. out the shoulders it's going to make your booty more that's more yeah, plump it's going to pop <laughs> that yeah, tends to more definition right? yeah, yeah exactly so i think that there it, it's really i think for um anyone, I know that you, a lot of trainers, a lot of coaches listen here. I think that the first thing that you have to do with your clients is develop rapport. Like they have to trust you. Yep. If you just go right out of the bat and you're like, you're going to, you're going to be eating in a caloric surplus and we're going to, we're going to take you away from the circuits and we're going to move you right into, <laughs> see ya. They're going to just slowly walk backwards to the door. Right. Mm -hmm. So we want to slowly develop rapport and trust with our clients, with our patients and explain to them the process. I think a lot of women also We've ne a lot of people don't take the time to explain why. Why is this so important? And I think for people, especially like me, if I were to ask you, why is this important? Why do I need to take creatine? What, what is it going to, if you explain it to me, then I can intellectually understand mm -hmm. that. And maybe I haven't emotionally bought in yet, mm -hmm. right? But there's part of me that understands what's happening. And then if there's trust in the relationship between the trainer and the client, then over, you know, a delta, you can start to see, you can start to see some results from that. Yeah. yeah. You work with a lot of women too, to help them balance out uh, their hormones yeah. is strength training the preferred form of exercise when yes. you now what now why is that why why is so i didn't know this early in my career um i was early on i was just you know kind of meathead trainer i knew exercises a new technique 
But when it came to hormone balance, when it came to, you know, overall health and wellness, I was just deficient. Yeah. But I was lucky to work with a lot of really smart um, individuals and, and some of them were functional medicine practitioners. And I remember them, the reports they would give me on their patients who strung, who did strength training as a primary form of exercise versus others. And one particular, I remember him saying, oh, this is the way that I have people work out now because they seem to balance out their hormones much faster and effectively with strength training. What's going on? What is it about strength training that helps with the hormone balance versus other forms of exercise? This is such a good question. I'm so happy that we're here. So uh, there's, there's many ways that strength training balances out a woman's hormones. The first, when we think about muscle in general, muscle typically serves uh, when I talk to women about muscle, it serves three functions. So it serves a mobility function, right? So our ability to walk and pick things up. And I was just recently um, in Italy with my husband. We went to the Amalfi Coast. And if you've ever gorgeous. been there, it's gorgeous. It's very hilly and there's no elevators, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, you have to take the, the bags off the train onto the platform and then roll it up the hill and all that. So um, there's a mobility function to muscle. Uh, serves a mobility function. The second is a metabolic function. It's the primary site for glucose utilization, for glucose storage, for fat utilization. Um, your muscle metabolism is largely going to dictate what your blood glucose levels are and what your blood lipids are going to be. And so for women, a lot of women actually in perimenopause will say, I don't know what's happening. Uh, I'm 45. I'm doing literally the same thing I was doing when I was 25, 35. And now my triglycerides, I have more triglycerides. My total mm -hmm. cholesterol is mm -hmm. creeping up. My LDL, like I have no idea and I'm doing the same thing. Part of that is the degeneration of muscle metabolism. Mm -hmm. If you're not strategic about lifting weights. So it has a metabolic function which will balance out glucose and insulin, of course, right? It's like muscle can take up glucose in an insulin-dependent and independent manner. So there's a metabolic balancing in terms of some of your metabolic hormones. Um, and then there's also a menstrual benefit. So uh, testosterone, uh, we know that, you know, testosterone is like famous for libido, but it's also really famous for maintaining muscle mass, for maintaining bone density, for heart health. And depending on how fit you are, every time you train, you're going to have a transient rise in testosterone. So the more fit you are, you know, you have a smaller effect because you, there's less muscle turnover, but anywhere from 10 hours to about 48 hours, you're going to have a transient rise in testosterone. Mm -hmm. So how great is that for women who, uh, you know, in perimenopause, for example, we see a lot of changes in mood. We see a lot of changes in, we see a lot of the sort of decrease in their muscle mass. Mm -hmm. um, so that transient rise in testosterone, and that's also very important for brain health as well, because testosterone and dopamine are very closely related. As one lifts, the other one tends to lift as well. So as testosterone is rising, your dopamine levels tend to rise, which is going to make you more, um, you know, likely to pursue things that matter to you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be, you know, you're going to be chasing, uh, the, you know, your goals and your dreams. And then the other piece to that, of course, is when you're lifting for a woman, it tends to have a balancing effect. It tends to uh, promote a progesterone to estrogen balance in the second half of the cycle. So if you're a woman who's still in her fertile years, including perimenopause, because you're still menstruating, albeit maybe more irregularly, what we see over time as a, just a natural consequence of aging is we see this stepwise decline in progesterone. There is an overall decline in estradiol, the main estrogen. Uh, there's three estrogens. Estradiol is the main one. Um, and estradiol in our perimenopausal years can oscillate quite aggressive. Like it can be up one month and then down the next month. So when we're training, it tends to promote a better progesterone estrogen balance. And for women who experience dysmenorrhea or premenstrual symptoms, this, if they're going to feel any type of symptom at all, any type of symptoms at all, it's going to be in the second half of the cycle. So all more important for you to be training, you know, all through the cycle. Um, and I often talk about this idea of training, you know, to failure, whether that's with heavy weights, you know, anywhere between like five and 30 reps, the literature suggests is, um, is uh, appropriate for muscle growth. Um, as long as you feel like I could have maybe punched out one or two, maximally three more uh, in that set. That's a, that's a proper um, progressive overload, or that's a proper way to train. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, you mentioned a lot of things there. One of them that stuck out to me was um, how muscle affects insulin. Yeah. 
is there a relationship between insulin resistance, um, even in the early stages before we can identify it as, let's say, pre-diabetes, is there a relationship between that and estrogen and progesterone? Is when, when insulin starts to go off, do we start to see those imbalances cascade or, or continue down the line? Yeah. So insulin resistance starts at the level of the muscle, right? As you, I, I know you've talked about this yeah. before on the show. Uh, and again, you don't just wake up in your 40s or your 50s with type 2 diabetes. Like this is a decade long process. And in, in some cases, you know, Dr. Gerald Schulman and his work has really elegantly showed that you can, like the, the insulin resistance starts as early as your 20s. Like mm -hmm, you can sure. have euglycemic level, you can have healthy blood glucose levels, but your ins, like your, you know, the beta cells of the pancreas are just like pumping out insulin to try and keep that blood glucose in that normal range. Uh, so that's sort of the first thing. Uh, your second uh, comment around estrogen and progesterone is certainly uh, it, it is well noted because when we are more insulin resistant, ins like if you are pumping out more higher levels of insulin, you will have uh, lower levels of something called sex hormone binding globulin, which is just basically a protein that binds sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone. So, and when it's bound, it's not useful. It's not useful, right? right. It's like basically. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's in, it's like in testosterone or, or estrogen that's like locked up. Now you can't use it. Exactly. Okay. So the higher your insulin levels, the lower your SHBG level. So there's like an inverse relationship mm -hmm. between the two. High insulin, low SHBG. So what can happen there is now that sex hormone binding globulin can't sop up, can't can't like bound, bind oh. the testosterone and the estrogen. So now testosterone is sort of free to wreak havoc. Estrogen is sort of free to wreak havoc in the, you know, to to the cells that it's, you know, that it's that it's affecting. And this is where we see uh, for women, PCOS or polycystic ovary That's syndrome. That's right, because it's connected to higher uh, free testosterone. Yeah, mm. yeah. Oh, wow. So you see <laughs> excess androgens in a woman with PCOS, but whenever we see high T, whenever we see high testosterone in a woman, it's almost always not because she's just inherently producing these super physiological levels of T. It's usually something else. And with PCOS, it I think it has its roots in insulin resistance, which if you go a level deeper is poor muscle metabolism, right? Mm. So she's probably not using that contractile tissue on a regular basis so that the muscle is, uh, you know, well-versed in sopping up that excess glucose uh, in the system that's driving up the insulin. Yeah. Is this anabolic resistance? Is that what yes. we're talking about right now? Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. more common? Is it becoming more common uh, now than, it, than it's been before? I would imagine because of the loss I, of strength that we're noticing. And yeah, I would. PCOS in particular is the most common hormonal derangement that we typically see. By the way, women. symptoms of that. Can you go over those? What are the symptoms of PCOS? It's irregular periods. like we, So it's amenorrhea. Um, it's infertility. So inability to get pregnant and stay pregnant. Uh, you'll typically see... Um, in extreme cases, you'll see things, something called Hertzuism, which is just male pattern hair. So you'll mm. see uh, hair in the, on the chin, you'll see hair um, on the chest, you'll see male pattern baldness. So like along the temples, mm. you'll see loss of hair. Uh, a lot of these women also, if you look at their labs, you're going to see dyslipidemia, you're going to mm. see you know high levels of triglycerides, high levels of total cholesterol. Uh, and then you'll also... Uh, you, you'll also see mood and affect changes. She may or may not tell you that, and that depends again on your rapport with your patient. Mm -hmm. um, but depression, anxiety, some of these, um, some of these issues are, are are rampant in women with PCOS. And and one of the best ways that you can overcome that is to have her strength train on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. we're getting that contractile tissue that, you know, that muscle is the main sort of uh, glucose disposal agent, right, that we have. So the more that she's training, uh, she's going to be able to pull in that glucose, which is there, you know, has this knock on effect of like lowering uh, insulin output from the pancreas, which is now going to help all systemically the cells um, of the body sensitize to insulin. And it's also going to raise SHBG. Oh, wow. Now okay. back, back to kind of what Justin was asking i'm curious to like <clears throat> with when it comes to like getting women to bulk and eat more yeah. how important is it that they're also eating a sufficient amount of protein and calories while also trying to do this yeah. like or do you just see positive benefits just simply by getting them to strength train can they see that from that alone you can see of course yes just from that alone a hundred percent yeah i think that i don't i don't know that there's any 
intervention that equates strength training across the board? I know we're talking about PCOS right now, but across the board, when we're talking about metabolic syndrome and dysfunction, type 2 diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular, all of the sort of big killers that we think about, I think that exercise should be the number one intervention. Um, in terms of nutritional um, interventions, um, I'll preface this by saying there are therapeutic interventions of, you know, nutritional therapies, and then there's sort of what you follow when you're healthy, right? So the the in the same way that you know if you contracted some bacterial infection and you went to the doctor and they wrote a script for antibiotics, you would take it for whatever it is, 10, 14 days. You wouldn't continue taking the antibiotics for the rest of your life. You would just take it as that therapeutic intervention to get rid of the bacterial infection that you had. Um, the same is true for nutritional therapy as well. Mm. So if you are someone who, if we're continuing the example of a, a PCOS patient, she has a uh, high levels of insulin, you know, it would be a good strategy for her to think about how we can lower blood glucose. One of those would be maybe a transient, underline, double underline bold, transient temporary reduction in carbohydrates mm -hmm. along with the protein. So this is where I've kind of, again, sort of changed. And but I, I've said this, I know a couple of times right in the show, like I've changed my view on this and that. It's like, I hope that any doctor changes their, or, or any trainer or yeah. anyone sort of changes their mind with time. Right. If you have someone who's still talking about the same thing, it's like, self peach diet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> in 2024, it's like, run. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say that. But I think protein, you know, incredibly satiating. Of course, it's going to chemically stimulate muscle protein synthesis, which is like kind of the goal again. We're trying to get more um, of that lean muscle for that woman with PCOS. So protein does play uh, a big role, I think, across the board, irrespective of the hormonal issue. I think women need to be thinking about protein, not as this, you know, I think protein is... Uh, I think it's traditionally looked at as like man, fire, barbecue, meat, yeah. you know, but meat is just as much and, and, and good quality protein sources are just as important for women um, as they are for, as they are for men. Now, yeah. I, yeah, I had kind of a, I guess a personal question. It's, it's, I'm just curious because I've seen a commonality with a lot of clients that I've had women that um, all shared uh, hypothyroidism yeah. and my wife, as well. And I'm just curious, like it, besides like genetic factors and like, why, why do we see this kind of, uh, common it's, it's commonplace. I think, uh, a lot of times and two, like, have we always, has this been around for a long time or is this like a new trend uh, upward tick in, in hypothyroidism or is this, uh, I, th I think that we're seeing more and more, uh, so hypothyroidism obviously is low functioning of the thyroid, um, which you can sort of get from uh, the name of it. But most women with hypothyroid, all if you're testing their labs, they're also produced, they're already producing autoantibodies, right? So they're already on the spectrum for Hashimoto's thyroiditis or the autoimmune condition that attacks the thyroid. Um, in terms of uh, prevalence, um, I think, it would be. I don't know if it's more or less. I don't know if it's more or less common. My guess would be more. I think our diagnostic capacity is better. I think that there's more. We have. Uh, we've sort of expanded. You know, I just said to you like hypothyroidism. You're already sort of on the spectrum for uh, mm. autoimmune disease. So I think that uh, our inclusion criteria uh, has also expanded. We're a little bit more uh, inclusive now. And then we're also seeing a lot of women um, take to social media to come like to, I, I can't tell you, we have this in our, in our help desk, in our email uh, system almost every week. My doctor's refusing to look at my autoantibodies or just screening for TSH. Hmm. Yeah. So I think that there's, crazy. Hmm. It, it's, cr it's crazy to think that you might just look at TSH, maybe T3 and, and T4 and not look at reverse T3 and not look at the auto antibody. Like it's crazy to hmm. me that we're still there, but we, we, uh, we get emails at, you know, in our help desk, like at least once a week, we have someone, mm -hmm. you know, wanting, we have a lab guide that we, um, that we've put together for, for women to download with like optimal ranges and, um, and when you should test your thyroid mm -hmm. and, and, and that kind of thing. And we, we're constantly getting that feedback that, the sort of allopathic or maybe more traditional um, route for thyroid care is very 
lackluster. Yeah. Is there yeah. a connection between, um, I've always read that uh, gluten seems to be connected in many yeah. cases to um, antibodies in the thyroid. Is yeah, that- I'm wondering like environmental factors, all that kind of stuff, like yeah. what, what's out there in terms of knowledge of, you know, what might be contributing. Well, gluten is interesting because it's the protein, the gliadin, it, it, it's the protein in the gluten that um, resembles um, the, the, the thyroid, right? So what happens- I see. You're building an immune reaction to that and then by- And then your immune system's like, wait a minute, that, that thing right like there, that's the gliadin, oh. go get it, right? So there's, there's, okay. a, there's a, uh, a morphology, there's a similarity in terms of the morphology of the protein. Interesting as as well, cerebellum, also very, if you have like a leaky, uh, you know, we always talk about a leaky gut, yeah. but there's also leaky brain, like the blood brain barrier, oh, wow. if that's sort of open as well, you can also is have- there a correlation between the two? If one's leaky, the other one tends to be? Always. Hmm. Yeah. So the cerebellum oh, also, morphology is very similar. So you can also have, you know, over a long period of time, you can sort of develop things like ataxia and all these different, uh, because your, your immune system is now attacking the cerebellum as well. So- Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. What are the symptoms of that? The symptom, well, yeah. crazy wife. I, I mean, yeah. So the cerebellum <laughs> is sort of the coordinator uh, of all of your motor, of all of your motor um, movements, right? So you'll have the motor cortex and the efferents that are going down to the body will go through the cerebellum and then, and vice versa. So there's like a smoothing. That's what, you know, if you ever stopped, not that you guys would ever be stopped, but if you're ever stopped for drinking, and they tell you to walk the line Got and it. they tell you to do this, Got it. Yeah. right? It, what they're, what they're testing for is the, um, what is the cerebellar's ability to sort of clean up those movements. Cause what will happen is you'll miss, right. right? Or it'll be, it'll be shaky, right? So the cerebellum basically cleans up our wow. motor movements. So motor yeah. movement hmm, changes would be a sign, especially yeah. if you have gut issues, like, yeah. Oh, I might have leaky balance, brain. Balance issues would oh, be wow. there as well. Like is, when they walk, when you walk the line, it's like one foot in front of the other. Is so leaky you, brain like leaky gut used to be I remember in the late 90s early 2000s I had like I said I've worked with some except been lucky to work with exceptional individuals yeah. who were ahead of the curve and I remember when they would bring up leaky gut the doctors that I trained traditional doctors surgeons they would overhear the conversations and they'd roll their eyes at me like leaky yeah, gut that right. now, now of course it's established yeah. like we call it you know what do they call it intestinal wall hyperpermeability, hyperpermeability, hyperpermeability. Yeah. is leaky brain like leaky gut used to be, or are it's they the same thing? Are they saying, are they, in other words, is the medical establishment like that doesn't exist or are they saying, Oh no, no, this is a oh, thing. That's it. You know, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the feelings are in the medical establishment yeah. around it. I would, um, like or, if I go to my doctor, I'm like, I think I have leaky brain. Is yeah. He like, Get out of my yeah, yeah. Yeah. He might give himself a lobotomy with yeah. how hard he rolls his eyes. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would say, you know, a, a really good person to talk to about this is Dr. David Perl- Perlmutter. I don't know if you've had Yes, him on I do. Show. No, I haven't, but I know he is. He's fantastic. I'm happy to, he's Phenomenal. So he talks a little bit about this as well. Often when we look at um, immunologically privileged sites, like the brain has a sort of its own immune system. We have the astrocytes yeah. and everything like that blood brain barrier. We used to think it's like impenetrable. Nothing can get in there, but right. uh, it, it's, uh, it's not, it's absolutely with poor diet with poor, you know, uh, when we see uh, metabolic syndrome, when we see inactivity, poor stress management, all these things over time can like nick away, if you will, yeah, it's sort of a crude, like it sort of can um, uh, nick away at that in, impenetrable layer between the brain and the body. W- does yeah. working on uh, the integrity of your gut um, also simultaneously then work on the integrity of the brain? Absolutely, yeah. Wow, what another, what, uh, yeah. That's so, so the reason why it's blowing me away. Super connected. I mean, I, I guess if I thought about it, it sounds logical, but what an, a great, another great way to sell why you should focus on gut health. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. just about your gut, it's about your brain yeah. not having that, that integrity. Very interesting. That's fascinating. So what's your, what's your favorite, what are your favorite things in the space right now that you're learning that are just, what do you like to talk to most or what do you <sighs> find most of your questions resol- you know, revolving around right now? I think for me, I talk a lot about strength training and fitness for women. So the questions that I get most often, I'm sure you guys also get this as well. It's like, can I lose weight and build muscle at the same time? Mm-hmm. Um, how do I train without injuring myself? That's a real issue mm-hmm. for my perimenopausal ladies who are now wanting to get into the gym that are kind of nervous about lifting heavy weights. They don't necessarily have the integrity or the, uh, you know, the, the motor patterning uh, to sort of figure that out. And then I think just what to do. I think that uh, I get a lot of questions around, uh, what does heavy lifting even mean? Like, how do I know that I'm approaching muscle failure? Yeah, like, mm-hmm. what are, how does that, what does that look like, feel like? So Is it those, harder for a woman in, in perimenopause or menopause to get leaner? 
because of the changes in hormones? Is that a real thing? Because I've heard women, I have, okay, so I'll I'll give you a personal story. My aunt, Mm -hmm. who I've been trying to convince to strength training now for 10 years, and so we constantly go back and forth, and I love her to death. She's wonderful. But she's like, you don't understand. Suddenly, I gain body fat around my midsection. Suddenly, um, I'm pre-diabetic, and nothing changed except for my hormones. And I'm always trying to tell her, well, strength training, I think that'll, but I hear that a lot. I hear that from female clients too. Like all of a sudden, like it, everything just changed. Is it harder? And if it is, what are, are there any things that they can do specifically to get their bodies to get leaner and fit that may be different than, you know, someone that, who, who isn't in that place? Yeah. Uh, your aunt, um, very astute observation with the belly fat. So that is something that we see in terms of the phenotype of fat or the type of fat that we typically produce changes as we age. So okay. usually uh, women will, uh, even though we have a general sort of disdain for it, we will typically put on weight in our bums, thighs, sort of lower sure. tummies, right? And that's under the influence of estrogen. As estrogen begins to wane in our 40s and then eventually going through that menopausal transition, you know, for most women, it's 51, 52 years of age, we will start to accumulate visceral fat. So that goes back Mm. to the insulin resistant conversation that we were having before when your uh, muscles are not sopping up that excess glucose, you have now a higher systemic output of insulin. And now your liver is going to be more, uh, your liver will continue. What happens when there's, you know, the liver has been exposed to insulin over a long period of time is now your liver will continue to produce glucose even in the presence of glucose, right? So there's this gluconeogenesis that's happening when Mm. it should be shut off. And the other thing that happens is um, the fancy word is, you know, de de novo lipogenesis, which Mm. is just like new fat, right? So your liver is now, there's a hepatic output of, of new fat. So we will see fat that now accumulates in and around the organs on the liver. We've all heard of NAFLD or, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and we see the spilling now of triglycerides and the cholesterol and things like that into the, uh, into the blood. So our cholesterol, and we sort of have this atherogenic dyslipidemia. So we see this change in our blood lipid levels that are more atherogenic genic mm. uh, in nature. So your aunt is correct in that she's like, I don't understand. Like I'm, you know, doing the same thing I always yeah, was. And now yeah. I have my, like my waistline is expanding. Um, that is because in part of A, the insulin resistance uh, and B, declining levels of estrogen. So for her and for many of the perimenopausal women, maybe they're listening to the show, there's sort of a, a beautiful marriage that can happen with the strength, with the strength training that we're talking about. And then the pharmaco, you know, the pharmacology of, of of hormone replacement therapy uh, where they might consider either taking, you know, this is obviously a very individual discussion with your provider, but, you know, maybe if, if you've already gone through uh, menopause, you might consider estrogen, you might consider progesterone, you might consider testosterone as well. Um, so she's not wrong. And there's a lot that's within your control, right? Yeah. So she's not wrong in that she's noticing ectopic fat. We call that ectopic fat distribution. Yes. So like that fat distribution, that's not typical for a female. Uh, it, it tends to actually look more of like male pattern, like the way that men typically distribute mm-hmm. fat. They'll typically distribute fat through the through the midline. So there's a lot within our control, strength training being absolutely one of them. Um, and, then your, and then your diet. So when we think about... Um, one of the beautiful things about strength training is I know for years we used to talk about like spot reduction. I'm like, I would just love to lose like, you know, whatever. Yeah. You can't do that, but you can certainly uh, direct your training to gain. And like, if you wanted to grow a booty, like you could do lots of squats and lots of deads and lots of all of that. Um And the same is true when we're thinking about visceral fat. Visceral fat also very positively responds to lowering your particularly ultra pro- ultra processed carbohydrates, um, fructose and things like that, because that will bring down in a very short period of time your, you know, the visceral fat that you're that you're either accumulating um, or that you have. So in a body. sense, you could affect the the type of fat distribution in your body by improving insulin sensitivity, yep. changing your diet, or at the very least reduce that that switch that happens as you go into perimenopause yeah, or menopause. Stay right here. Like, okay, you're, you're already starting to do something I wanted you to do, which is cool. Uh, like for my trainers and coaches, right? Because we have a lot that are listening. And I remember that if I were to look back at all the clients that I train, that this is probably where I was challenged the most was women going through menopause. I just did yeah. not, uh, I didn't have the education, the experience around it. And if there was ever a client that I felt the most challenged, it was was helping them. So yeah. if I was a trainer <clears throat> and you, or you were helping me as a trainer, years ago and you like, here's your checklist, Adam, like, you know, 
ask her about this first, then address this, then address, would you, could you give me like a, like your top five, like here, 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 here. Mm -hmm. And that's controllable, right? Obviously we can get hormone intervention, but the things that I'd want her to control first herself before we even go that direction, what would that look like? I think for, and I guess it's going to depend on her level of fitness. If she's new to the gym, uh, certainly I'd be wanting to start off with like proper, like range of motion. I loved what you said on my show. You said a range of motion that you can own, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times women, they might have some sort of arthritide, maybe it's an OA or an RA or psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid or something like that, where the, that's precluding them from having full range of motion. Sure. So you want to understand where their um, uh, where their deficiencies might be, and you want to work on a range of motion that is full for them and pain free for them. And if it's possible, um, you know, increase that range of motion with time. Okay. Sometimes with our like with a rheumatoid, let's say, which is a destructive autoimmune uh, condition of the joints, you can't necessarily improve the range of motion, but you can preserve it um, through. You know, and you, you're not focusing for someone with RA. You're not necessarily focusing on heavy weights. You're just focusing on like let's just get them to move something, yeah. just like an overhead press. Like let's just get them to have that mobility in the shoulders sure. so they can fully, you know, bring the bring the arm all the way up or as as much as they can. So it would be range of motion and joint health. Um, can they tolerate? Uh, can they axial load? So can they put? Can they do a barbell back squat? Can they do any type of deadlifting? That kind of thing. Um, and then I would be looking at where they are in the menopausal transition. So are they still menstruating, albeit irregularly? Okay. Um, if they've already transitioned, I mean, menopause is just like one day in your life. It's just you qualify for the diagnosis of 12 months without a without a yeah. period. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah. But if you're past that day, then the management of that pa management of that client is much easier because okay. in they're in some ways clinically uh, or in practice if you're a trainer and you have a perimenopausal client a perimenopausal client in some ways is clinically more challenging because she's so variable right she's uh -huh. kind of a moving target until she really goes through that transition um so I would want to know, is she still menstruating? Do we think she's in like early stage perimenopause where she's still menstruating regularly? Maybe she skipped a month or two um, or has it been several months and she's just kind of in the waiting room now figuring out like, have I gone? Okay, this months? is good because yeah. I, I mean, shame on me. I would have, have lumped everybody just un under menopause and that almost yeah. the same protocol applies to her as it does if she was just coming in. So there's actually a different yeah. protocol. Okay. Yeah, and even injury risk, right? So we see women who are in their first years, there tends to be the type of injuries that they sustain is different than a menopausal woman. So in some ways, a menopausal woman, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense at all, but in, in some sense, she's more male, right? Because she has lower levels of mm. uh, estrogen. So she's not going to have as many, uh, let's say, ten, she might not have as much um, uh, muscle strain, so or she might not have as much tendon injuries as someone who is younger and still cycling. Um, so that's that's something to consider. And then in terms of diet, if you're a trainer who's working with your client in terms of diet, again, prioritizing protein for these women. Back to the anabolic resistant uh, conversation, there's two ways that you can stimulate muscles, mechanically in the gym and then chemically in the kitchen, right? So we want to be driving MPS, muscle protein synthesis, as much as we can. And we do that through consuming more protein. Where I like to counsel women to think about, especially in perimenopause and menopause with their protein, is to stop thinking about protein as a percentage of your total calories. So, you know, sometimes with a diet, you'll say it's like 30% carbs and 40% yeah. protein and 30% or whatever. That, that zone. Yeah, the zo yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever it is. Or keto is like 70, 20, 10. And think about it as a gram target. Yeah. So pull the protein out of the percentages. It's a gram target. That's the first and most important priority in your diet. And then you can back in the calories, the rest of the calories that you're consuming, the carbohydrates and the fat based on your preference. Um, some people like higher fat, some people like more carbs, you know, and you can sort of, you know, make a diet, you can create a, a program for them that they're going to more likely stick to over a longer Delta. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. What so you, great yeah. hearing you say that too, because that's kind of, I mean, that's always a, the protocol that we say first, like when we get somebody and that's, you're talking about a very specific situation, but I feel like that's such great advice across the board for someone. It's like, stop looking at it as a percentage, like here's my goal body weight. I want to be at, go after it in grams of protein. Totally. And then the, letting the other stuff fall into place. You'd be surprised how much just that alone oh. changes so much 
for everybody. And women have, I find, I, I don't know if you find this, if you ha- if you get this feedback, but I have a lot of women saying, oh my God, that's so much protein. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. That's yes. why it's such a, yeah. I feel like it's such a important thing to address first. Yeah. Because in my experience, uh, almost every client I ever trained was They're under, under especially my female clients were under eating protein yeah. significantly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they misunderstand what high protein is. It's like, I had two eggs for yeah. breakfast. Yeah. Well, yeah. You need to have yeah. 120 grams yeah. a day. Yeah. So. Deli meat in there. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel yeah. about GLP ones? How do you feel mm-hmm. about some aglutide, trisepatide, and these these new interventions that are now peptides? Yeah, huge, hugely, in my opinion, hugely uh, going to impact our space and just in general culture. Yeah, are you working with them? What are you seeing? I I'm not working with them. I am very interested to see how this is going to pan out. Hey, real quick, sorry to interrupt you. Look, we have a sale this month on some programs. We have a beginner program, Map Starter. It's fifty percent off. Then we have a bundle. That's different. It's called the Starter Bundle. That includes our most popular programs. That's also 50% off. So if you're interested in that, just click on the link at the top of the description below. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Intera Skincare. These are peptide-based skincare products and hair restoration products. So these are the real deal peptides, things that really do make things different. You try the skincare products, it will accelerate how your skin heals. It will reduce wrinkles, make you look more youthful, reduce inflammation, and their hair restoration products are incredible as well. Help regrow hair from a lot of different angles. Again, this is all peptide-based. Go check them out. Go to enteraskincare.com. That's E-N-T-E-R-A skincare.com forward slash M-P-M. Use the code M-P-M. Get 10% off your order. All right, here comes the show. I think that in terms of when we're thinking about this in obesity medicine, I think that this can be a lifeline for some women uh, and men. Um, we don't all have the same levels of ghrelin, right? So yeah. some people just have this like hedonic <laughs> hunger. And even, you know, coming back to our beautiful uh, menopausal women, those menopause munchies, like you just, you some women, they just, just they're always hungry. They're always hungry. Mm-hmm. They're always hungry. So we can, we do see GLP-1s, um, tamper certainly tamper that uh i would like to see um right now like the the safety profile like they've been around for a long time i know that they're super popular right now but they've been around for like 20 years so the safety profile of them is, is really great what i would like to uh caution or maybe have people who are considering it or who are on it take note of is that you also have to major in the majors on the lifestyle yes. side, right? So you still have to be majoring on, you still have to be getting the, the the gram target of protein. You still have to be mechanically stimulating the contractile tissue, your skeletal muscle. You still have to be managing your stress. You still have to be sleeping well. These things all matter. And I would say the same is true with hormone replacement therapy. You just can't jump yeah. to estrogen replacement therapy, testosterone, and think that that's going to be, you know, it's going to wash away a a multitude of sins. Like you also have to do the other work. I honestly think you're hitting exactly why we're seeing the negative press on it with the amount of muscle loss. And the thing that's happening is people are purely using it as a way to just just cut calories. Yeah. 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 Right. But I don't, I don't know that, uh, I, I've seen some data that suggests that while you can increase, like you can increase right. sensitivity at the uh, of insulin sensitivity, oh, they're, they're at the muscle, the they're muscle preserving. Uh, yeah. But what's yeah, happening I, is people are just eating less. exactly. They're and I think those weight. cases, right. those right. cases yeah. are the cases of people majoring in the, those things yeah. and mm-hmm. actually focusing on the the core stuff. Uh, yeah, I love asking this question because the way you work with uh, patients is very much like a coach. Like you coach them, you work through behavioral. You and I have talked that yes. you know. You, I, I hear a lot of what you say sounds like. Behavior modification. Mm-hmm. This is where I see some of the biggest uh, which potential is not benefit. an outcome, right? It's no, like, stop mm-hmm. thinking about the outcome and start thinking about the behaviors that lead into the outcome that you want. One hundred percent. So yeah. this is where I see some of the potential benefit because if a GLP one is allowing you to not engage in this behavior over three, four, six months, ten months, or whatever, yeah, we can weak though we can weaken those neural connections between you and that whatever that behavior was that was space, called, yeah. and then maybe replace it with another behavior and use it kind of as a bridge. Yeah, that's where I can see the potential for people um, like us um, in using these things. But you have the exact right approach. You could tell you've worked with a lot of people, mm. like real people, and mm-hmm. not just said here take this and right. and and come back and see me. So that's great. Thank so you. Uh, when you're, first off, how long have you been working with patients now? 
Uh, class of 2003. So, oh, that's what awesome. Is that where are we? 24. So 20. Four I mean, years. I retired from 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 practice uh, at year 19. So where are we now? Year 21. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Are you seeing any any trends? It feels like more people are taking what you're saying. Uh, like it doesn't sound as radical as it did 10 years ago. It's it's so funny when my first book came out and even just talking about blo- like even just talking about menstrual blood, like all the men would just sort of like, yeah. <laughs> just like hold on for dear life. So I, I think that that conversation is now more out in the open. I think perimenopause uh, and menopause, like I said, is definitely having a moment. I think that our you know, the women that came before us had to sort of suffer in silence, like the hot flashes and it's just like suck it up buttercup. And this is just, you know, what, what happens when you're aging and we're seeing more and more women um, really uh, embrace aging well. We're sort of, mm-hmm. and I like to, I like to think about, uh, I know that there's a big anti-aging, like, um, like I want to look like, I want to look good, you know, like yeah. I want to look good in my dress. I want to look good as long as I can. But I also very strongly believe that it is such a privilege to age uh, it's such a privilege to become, you know, a father, as as some of you have been, as you know, to become a mother. I hope one day I'll be indicted into the grandmother club, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think about what are some of the things, and I I borrowed this a little bit from uh, Peter Atia because I know he talks about, I think he calls it the cent- centenarian Olympics, mm. where he's like, what do I want to do as a centenarian? What are the things when I'm a hundred? Uh, I want to, I, and I don't remember the metrics that he's lined out, but he wants to be able to bench press this and squat this and and what have you. And so I've taken that because I love that concept. And I think about what is it going to mean for me to be like a kick-ass grandmother, Mm. right? Like when I have, I want to be able to get down on the floor and play with my grandchild. I want to be able to pick my grandchild up. That means that I have to have a certain amount of proprioception and leg strength and glute strength and quad strength and balance and all of that to be able to get back Mm -hmm. up off the floor. I want to be able to run after uh, that toddler. Uh, if I take, you know, my grandchild to the park, that means I have to have a certain VO2 max. I have to have preserve my type 2 fiber. You know, so these are some of the things that that I'm starting to think about now in, in my 40s. And maybe that's just, you know, hopefully I'm getting, hopefully I'm getting wiser and I'm starting to think a little bit about what the real meaning of life is. Um, and for me, that's, you know, family is very important to me and, um, and, and taking, you know, savoring, uh, and, and finding joy. I was, uh, on my recent trip to Italy, I was talking to my husband and we came up with this, um, term. I haven't really talked about it, uh, publicly, but I'll just sort of, ex- I'll tell you guys and I'll see how you, you can give me some feedback. <laughs> right. uh, I love the term offensive joy. Mm. And often when we think about offensive, usually it's like something that's like an insult mm-hmm. or something is offensive to you. But if you think about it in a sports context, there's offense and there's defense, right? So when you're mm. on the offense, you're being proactive about something. And I think for women in perimenopause, as I am, or in menopause, it's in some ways it's a second spring. It's a way for us to reevaluate. We've spent many decades serving other, we've been mothers to children and wiping mm-hmm. up the snot and taking them to soccer and all the things. And it's a, it's a time of our lives where we can get back to who we are. Mm. So understanding what are some of the things that really bring me joy? Like, effect, like how can I be proactive in creating joy and pleasure in my life? Because I think that so many women, maybe your aunt feels this way where she's stressed like there's so much chronic stress and it's like is it that you're you're stressed because you're doing too much or is it because you're not doing enough of what you love mm. and you're not balancing out the the you know the need the have to do's and the get to do's i i love this mm. conversation and it also this there's some parallels with men men that retire go through something yeah. similar where yeah. they're just like their whole life was like, provide for the family do this and it's like oh i couldn't wait till retirement and then they get there and they're depressed yeah, yeah. so yeah. staying in this topic uh are there things with clients that, that you exercises or practices uh that you give them to try and find that because sometimes when you've been uh, serving others for so long or at this focus on this goal then you get there and you realize like i'm not happy i'm not doing what's you yeah. don't even know how yeah to find what makes you happy. Yeah. I mean, is there things that you recommend that they do to try and figure that out? Because I'm sure someone's listening right now is like, oh my God, that's me. Like yeah. I'm done being a mother now and now I'm like just supposed to be living for me and I don't even know where to start. I think the first thing is 
this was very useful for me is writing out a desire list. Well, like, what are the things that you desire? Because so many times we're rushing through our day, we're rushing through our to-do list. We don't even think about what are some of the things that make me happy. And it doesn't have to be this sort of hedonic, like someone's fanning and like feeding you grapes, right? It doesn't have to be that, but it can be a cup of coffee, you know, out, you know, by the window or, out, you know, in nature, you can go outside and sit if you have a balcony or you have a porch that you can, it can just be taking a quiet repose and having your cup of coffee in the morning. It's finding the little pieces of sweetness um, through the day. And then really getting in, you know, sometimes I'll ask women, I've, I've run uh, clinics with women before where I'm like, okay, we're going to write a desire list. And everyone's like, what is she talking about? <laughs> I understand the language, like it's English, desire. I know what that means, but I don't really, I don't really know desire, what I want. And if you just create some quiet space, some of the smaller little delights will come up, like mm. the cappuccino or being able to walk, uh, you know, taking an evening walk with your family or, you know, whatever. Th those are some of the things that I that I like to uh, like to do every day. Um, but then it can also be some of the bigger things, like some of the bigger dreams. Like maybe you want to learn a language. Maybe you want to travel. Maybe you want to take uh, a class or a ballroom. I had someone on my Instagram the other day saying, oh, I just want to take ballroom. I was, I posted about pickleball because this is like my new obsession. I'm obsessed with pickleball. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I want to do ballroom dancing, but my husband doesn't want to go. And it's like, just go. Like, yeah. they, like they're singles. Like they have, you know, you could just be a single, you'll be paired up with someone. But if ballroom dancing is going to bring you happiness and joy, and that's like the favorite hour of your week, like Tuesday night or whatever, when you go to your ballroom class, absolutely find time to make that happen. Um yeah. Dr. Sam, how, how how much of that is also maybe like ignoring media, social media, the yeah. world, because you know, it glamorizes what it can sell and what it can often sell is sex appeal, youth, uh, you know, like th things that the market tells you is valuable. But, mm -hmm. the, but in the reality, it's not everything that's valuable. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why older societies seem to like uh, look at people as they age in prestige and they give them yeah. so much honor. Yeah. Whereas these newer societies, not so much where it's kind of like you're supposed to disappear. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much, cause I know you coach uh, people all through lifestyle. Do you ever tell people like, turn off your social media, like stop looking at that stuff. Yeah. Cause it's just telling you the wrong. Yeah. The news never reports on the planes that land, right? It's, yeah. like, there's always, it's like, they're always yeah. going to be trying to, pull, steal your attention, right? Here's the new drama. Here's the new virus. Here's the new war. Here's the new whatever. Um, and I think that that keeps us, it, it, you know, there's, there's different currencies that we pay in, right? So the most obvious one is money. We pay for, we go for your coffee, you pay for your coffee, whatever. But there's also attention. That's also a currency. And so when you're attention, when you are constantly spending your attention on social media, it takes away from your own goals, your own dreams, your own desires. And so you can, you know, wake up at 45 and say, I don't know what my desires are. It's like, well, stop doom scrolling and have, create some white space, create some time for yourself. And those desires will come up because they're, you know, I don't have, for, for example, I, whenever I've had this conversation with women, I, ne you know, I'll say, I'll give them the example, like, I don't have a desire to play basketball. Right, because that's not meant for me. I'm not meant to play basketball, but I do have a desire to speak many languages. I'm very attracted to, you know, Italian and French and Greek and Arabic and all the, you know, all the things that sort of delight me. But that's because those desires are meant for me, and I've been quiet enough to allow those things to sort of oh. to to, mm -hmm. to allow those things to sort of bubble up. And so you don't have to be a polyglot like you, you like that doesn't have to be your desire but giving yourself some space and maybe a social media fast that's a fast that i'm happy to promote like you can do a 24 48 96 hour <laughs> fast great. that feels feel, that's a great fast um and funny enough too my uh we were talking before we started recording about my my children my 13 year old uh this is probably going to be the biggest regret of my life but he has a phone mm. Um, all of his buddies are on Snapchat mm -hmm. and I can tell when he has been oh, on yeah. his phone, his totally. mood, oh, clearly. he's yeah. angry, he's clearly. Quick, to, quick to snap, yep. quick to yell. And so we do the same thing with him. It's like, the, you you can't be on your phone. Like you have to put your phone away. We're going to have sort of a family fast and we're going to go for a walk, go for a bike ride, play basketball, whatever. Yeah. I have two, yeah. I have four kids, but they're a huge age gap. And my mm -hmm. older two, 19 and 15 soon, they had, well, especially my 19 year old, unfettered access to the internet. I yeah. was young when he was born. I was working a lot. This yep. is when 
it kind of was a new thing. So I really didn't, and we really, didn't really know. I didn't think yeah. about it uh, yeah. much. So we just had tons of access. My yeah. younger ones, it's going to be very restricted. Mm-hmm. And the way I look at it, it's like as a health and fitness expert now, um, I wouldn't allow my kids around just all kinds of different, you know, garbage food and then say, hey, you guys, uh, regulate yourselves. Yeah, yeah. They don't have the ability to regulate yeah, yeah. themselves. Yeah. So with the, the internet, it's like they don't have the ability. They have access to everything. Everything. And we are their substitute frontal lobes. Like That's, they're, yeah. even though my 13 year old thinks he is, he knows more than his mom who's 46. Yeah. You know, it's like, I know, it's like, I love that you are 13 and you know more than me already, honey. And, <laughs> yeah. and I am your substitute frontal lobe until you're 25 because we see that's when the brain matures, right? Yeah. It's at the same time as a skeleton, it, you know, matures around 25 ish. Um, so I have to be the person who is putting in those boundaries for him because he's unable to do that for himself. And even when we t- when we take him, we go play pickleball, we do the basketball, we're playing soccer, whatever, he feels so much better. And he'll say to me, he's able to articulate, I feel so much better yeah. when I'm not on he's my still phone all the fight time. You over it. But then he goes back to it, yeah. right? Yeah. Because he just doesn't have that you know, that brain yeah. maturity to be able to to inhibit some of those lower brain centers that are getting that dopamine hit every time he's yeah. I literally just got an argument with my daughter this morning. Yeah. She's like, why do I have time limit? Because we put time limits on on yeah. apps and stuff. Yeah. Why do I still have time limits? I don't I get good grades. I do this, that, and the other. Yeah. You're not so 25. We all, yeah, yeah, we're still having yeah. a discussion about this. <laughs> yeah. But I notice such profound improvements yeah. in her mood and our connection. And sleep, everything. right? So many kids, oh, yeah. especially over the pandemic, like so many kids mm. were up all night on that mm-hmm. thing. Right, because they had no other form of connection. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Awesome. I want to uh, I want to talk to you because you have experience in the competitive world, mm-hmm. and I found that um, I did that later on uh, in in my fitness journey, and was really fascinated by what I saw. And I'm curious if you experienced something similar. Um, you know, leading up to that, I had over what 15 years of training normal clients. Of course, I've seen all kinds of different. Uh, relationships with exercise and food. And when I got in the competitive world, I was really excited. I thought, oh my, this is going to be the brightest minds. And like when it comes to nutrition and exercise, mm-hmm. I can't wait to learn. Even being with the experience I had, I went into it with the idea of like yeah. I could learn so much. Yeah. What I ended up finding was more uh, dysfunctional relationships with exercise and nutrition that I had seen yeah. in the general population. Totally. This blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Did, the, did you experience it? A hundred percent. Wow. Yeah. And I had a coach. So the first time I was, I'm going to get a coach. They're going to help me with my nutrition. They're going to help me with the dieting down and, you know, peak week and all that and peak month, blah, blah. And the the food that she put me on. I was just going to ask you how quickly did you fire your broccoli? <laughs> it, was, it was, yeah, it was like bricken. It was like chalk. It was like chicken and broccoli or it was, you know, cod or what was, it wasn't cod. Tilapia. It was, tilapia. It was tilapia, yeah, tilapia and asparagus. <laughs> just, yeah. And I, Called it. Yeah. to this day, I cannot have, I, I, I mean, asparagus is great. Uh, I can't have it. I had so just the sm- I can't. You traumatized yourself. I traumatized I traumatized myself out of a vegetable group. So I, I just, <laughs> uh, yeah, so much disordered eating, yeah. body dysmorphia. Um, I th- women would go like you know you're the leanest that you're going to ever be on stage, right? And then as soon as you you know you're starving, so maybe you go and you have a normal meal or you have whatever binge. Binge, right? So, which is crazy. Um, oh, a 30 and then pound they, weight gain in, in a couple months, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And then they would hide, right? They would feel so disgusting. They'd be so, so shameful because, of course, leading up to it, everyone is, you're, you're oh getting God, all you're this amazing. social feet. Yeah. Look at how good you look. Mm-hmm. You look so great. You look so, and, and then when you're, then when you put on more, like you're holding more water because you're having carbohydrate, you're just eating like a normal human would. Um, I think that there's a lot of, um, desire to get back to that leanness. Um, yeah. So there's, the, yeah. You're, you, you're obviously a very confident, intelligent woman. Uh, but when you competed, did that challenge you? Did you feel yourself get pulled into, Maybe oh this might be dysfunctional. Did you or were you like you are now, where you could kind of see it for what it was? Because that's a challenge. That would be a, such a challenging yeah, space. Yeah, I mean, if I, if we're being completely truthful and the spirit of transparency and honesty, I was very hard on myself. Yeah. So it was like I this is my first competition. I was like I'm going to smash this out of the water. So I was very strict with myself. It was um, it was difficult because you sort of find you you get into this, like you start checking all the time. You're just checking, yeah. like, how, what does it look like? Am I, is my stomach little? Is my, do I see my shoulders a little bit more? Like how's the glutes coming in? What are the times? So you, you start to, I would notice these, um, 
uh, thought patterns. Um, I think, um, so I do think that I was affected by it for sure. Yeah. 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 And do you, do you often recommend if you get patients who are like, I want to compete, you often recommend don't? There's, yeah, I, uh, I, I think competing, um, and one, I would love to go to the, I haven't gone to the Arnold yet. I would love to go and like, just see the Arnold and, and see all the competitors there. But I think the idea of competing is inversely related to salutogenesis or, you know, just like health promotion, yeah. right? I think you are so unhealthy. Yes. The moment that you are on stage, you're dehydrated, you're, um, you know, you're nutrient deficient, you're all of these things, um, severe caloric deficit, all, all, all of the things that happen in order for you to get stage lean, um, it is direct, it's inversely proportional to health. So I, it depends on your, if your goal is to compete and you don't have, you know, if, if it's a, if you, if you don't have a longevity, uh, or a health goal and you, all you want to do is get up on stage, you know, I can certainly counsel you with that. But my number one, um, priority would be taking care of the psyche and like thinking about the intrusive yeah. thoughts, all the checking that happens, all the, um, you know, taking in kind all the comments that you will start to get like, Oh my God, are you a dancer? You look so beautiful. You're so lean. You're so this, you're like all just, that is a, an ideal that is completely not sustainable and not healthy for women. Women should not. And, you know, kind of tying this back to menstrual cycles. So many women, myself included lost. I lost my period for three months after I competed. Of course. Um, I, the last, I mean, I remember the check-in, I, I forget the um, exact number, but it was like, I was at 10%, something like that, 9 or 10% body fat, which for a woman is completely ridiculous. Like a woman <laughs> should never be that lean, ever. No. Um, and so, uh, and in that sport, in in the fitness, in the, you know, the competitive uh, bikini and figure sport, like these women, like half of them don't have their cycles regularly, yeah. right? And even, in, even at the top level of sports in general. Uh, it's common. It's mm -hmm. very, very common, and th sometimes it's all, it can be even reinforced by some of the coaches, right? Because mm -hmm. they have this association with, like, the leaner that she is, the better her performance is going to be, yeah. right? Yeah. So you can have you can have these sort of relationships that are even coming top down from your coaches mm -hmm. um, that are that are sort of. Uh, presented as normal and part of like, if you want to be part of the top percent, the top 1%, this is like the sacrifices mm -hmm. that you have to make. So this I, is the, yeah. this is the part that concerns me the most with And part of why I was asking this question is that what I, not only did I, I would never compete again. Right. Right. Yeah. So what I saw was I saw the same, we saw the same things. And then there's this, this cycle of you do your show, you get all this, you, you love it. You get in great shape. You eat up all the attention. Your Instagram grows because you use all your imagery. And, and now people are asking you questions. Now you become a coach and then now you're the teaching. Other. And it's like, we, and we, and I feel like some of the most popular people in the fitness space are these competitors sure, yeah. who are advising these people. And yeah. it's like, man, when, when I realize, oh my God, this space was just riddled with people with body dysmorphia, eating disorders, and these are now the people that are coaching our other uh, other people yes. that are getting into fitness. Like, and and first time ever in my life or in my coaching journey of over twenty years, I started to see the last decade a lot of like people just entering the fitness or just getting into working out and wanting to go right to a show because right. they follow so and so, mm. and she's beautiful, and she's got all these followers, and uh, mm. I want to be like her, and so. I, it's it's uh, it's interesting to me, and I'm also uh, concerned on that we're setting so many people up uh, for failure or the wrong direction, in, especially in relation to health. Yeah. yeah. So that's what in, I in regards to body fat percentage around that. I, yeah. And I would love to know if I'm if I'm on point, but generally when I would tell my fit the body fat percentage, I would say, or the range that I would give women that is a good fit, healthy, lean. If you're consistent with working out, you take this seriously. Would be like between eighteen and twenty two percent or so. Great. Is that am yeah, I? Great. You agree with that? Exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And another, we can look at body fat percentage. We can also look at FFMI, right? So the fat free mass yeah. index as well. So this is just what are the uh, how much of your body is metabolically active tissue that's not fat. Um, right. So that's another. A lot of times people will look at let's say BMI as more of an antiqu. I mean, it's it's a measurement. It's right. you know generally 
can be predictive of some things, but um, it can, it won't take into account, let's say, lean body mass. So, yeah, yeah, it doesn't take into. So if you I'm have a lot obese. Of, I have a high BMI because of my lean body yes. mass. Yes, I mean you look at yeah, you yeah. look very <laughs> obese, right? Yeah. So if you, but if you were to look clinic. at your FFMI, that's a much better measure mm -hmm. of your metabolic health and your health overall. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, I wanted to talk about something else that I heard you you credited Sal uh, for, but I don't think I've ever heard Sal say that. And if so, I want to talk about it. Uh, junk volume. Oh, well, just you said, the, oh, was yeah. that you? Well, that's, is that yours? And you no, gave we him that credit or what? Cause he's never said that. No, shit. no, no, no. We were talking on that's the such show. a great topic. That's yeah. an old, that's an old uh, term. I don't know if I said it specifically, but we were talking about how yeah, much we volume We were talking you about what you should feel like after, yeah. uh, after a workout. It's like, you should feel really great. Like you shouldn't feel like you've run yourself yeah. to the ground. Although I will say that I do enjoy some of those sessions as well. <laughs> uh, but I think that, um, what our conversation was around this idea of training too much, yeah. right? So are you in the gym, you know, four, five, six, seven uh, times a week? Well, you're probably you're probably not rested and, and recovered from the previous training session. Um, and we were talking about sort of moving into this like junk volume territory. Like how long is the session? Is it 60 minutes or is it like four hours, you yeah, know? Yeah. So, you know, after you're 20th set uh are you really you know I, I, what you know your fatigue is, has set in at that point like what is the yeah. uh you know what is the uh the you know the ROI on that I mean so I love we that I, yeah. like, I don't mm -hmm. think we've ever used that term on our show mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. like that and talked about that because I also think another category that falls into junk volume because I was guilty of this in my early 20s is you know, there's obviously an order of operation of most valuable exercises. And, you know, I, as a young kid, not knowing what he's doing, I'm, I'm doing a ton of just junk volume. I'd spend an hour and a half in the All gym. All the machines. Yeah, right? doing yeah. You know, lateral raises and little weird exercises and fill, and not squatting, not deadlifting, not overhead pressing, these movements. That, and I wish someone would have guided me better. So I've never thought of using the term junk volume before. And I, yeah. I can't believe we haven't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. I, I, you for I do. I like that. What, I like it a lot. Um, just because people are going to want to know, what does your training look like? You're, you now you're. This is your fanatic. You're a fitness. Uh, you know, I love individual. training. You yeah. love it. You love, love working it. out. Yeah. It's your thing. Mm. Um, what does yours look like? Uh, right now, it's either four or five days. Um, I train legs, uh, lower body. I do twice. I find that it takes me, I, I usually train it's Tuesday and Friday and I just need that amount of time in between to recover. Um, usually it's like my hamstrings that take me, it's sort of the, the linchpin that keeps me from training more often because my hamstrings, hamstrings get really sore. And then I'll do two, um, upper body. So there's always going to be shoulders in there. Uh, I was joking with you, you know, all women want two things and I'm sure this is in your muscle yeah. mommy program. It's like, we want nice, big, juicy glutes and we want delts that look like yeah. glutes as well. Right. <laughs> too. So yeah. we want nice, yeah. big, uh, shoulders. So I'm always working on lateral delts. Um, Delts in general, but you get like when you're doing back, you get a lot of revert, yeah. you get a lot of the posterior delt where you're working chest, you get um, anterior. Um, and then uh, if I am, so it's a shoulder workout and either a back or a chest. So it's either a shoulder and a, a pull or a shoulder and a press. Awesome. Uh, and then if I'm there for another day, then I'll, I don't know, I probably. Well yeah, it's usually four days. Well, yeah, that's awesome. Well, you yeah. obviously look like uh, you know what you're doing. Have you noticed, this is one thing that I noticed, as I've gotten older, I've been doing this for a long time, and so me and my peers, there was a little bit of a difference between us when we were younger, but as yeah. I've gotten older, yeah, yeah. I see my friends, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Like yeah. It used to be that I just kind of looked like I worked out, and you kind of didn't. Mm. Now you're like, you know, I bro, I couldn't get out of bed for two days. My back was hurting, and um, I just got put on this prescription. Like, are you noticing that with your? Oh, there's a huge. I, I think that that tangent is like very slow in the beginning, and then over time, yeah. Yeah. it it really does. Uh, it really does widen for sure. And one uh, another thing that I was chuckling about when we were uh, when you were on my show was when you train. And you're in your 40s and your 50s, like you want to tell everybody your age. Yeah, right? it's true. Like, it's like you're like, I'm 46. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, you'll, you'll have people like, what? You're 46? <laughs> you know, my had, I had the biggest compliment. Um, my 11 year old, his his friends were like, he had asked, How old do you think my mom is? Like, I don't know why he even asked this question, but uh, they were like, Oh, she's like 30, 35. And I was like, <laughs> I'll take it. Winning. Right? I'll take winning. it. Awesome. Winning, yeah. right? Yeah. I'll take it. So I think, um, you know, training, particularly strength training, like cardio, you know, you're going to improve your endurance, you're going to improve your uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. But in particular, when we we're talking about strength training, um, if you are a vain woman, 
like myself, uh, you are, you know, it's, it is very good for your skin. It's very good for, uh, you know, obviously the way that you look. I think when you are, one of the things I would like to do in my, in my work over the course of my career is to, is to move, to reframe this like skinny, you know, mm. and I think that we're doing it. I think there's a lot of people who are moving the needle alongside with me, but moving from skinny to, to strong, because yeah. when you're, when you're skinny and you're 60, and you're skinny and you're 70, that is no longer a good look. Not you know? No. Um, you wanna you wanna fill that out, you know, and you wanna fill that out with muscle. So I think um, you know, being skinny, I think, has uh you can probably get away with it uh when you're when you're younger, uh, but you really wanna be reconsidering that uh as you as you age. How how as a woman has it been for you for this? This is something that I've shared on the podcast that I've noticed now in my 40s. Um uh, that I find really cool. And I like to communicate to the, the younger generation that's just kind of getting started is that it does seem to have gotten much easier as I've got, because I've invested in lifting for yeah. so long. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, boy, I just got to kind of touch the weights and I can keep a muscular frame that is better than what I had done for the first five years of lifting every day, training consistently. Have you found something similar like the amount of volume it takes and like even what, you know, you would consider out of shape version of you is still probably way better than you, your first five. Like, I mean, I've noticed that. Have you noticed the same thing? Yeah. I mean, you've put in the, you've, you have an asset now, right? Yes. So you've invested in that asset and that asset has grown. I think that, I think that the estimate, if you, if you have the muscle, I think that it's, is it one third maybe, or 25 to 33%, you need- Way the, less volume. Yeah, way less volume to maintain yes. that asset, right? So you don't have to always be killing yourself. Like building muscle is a lot of work, yeah. but once you have it, maintaining it is is much easier. Um, yeah, I love to sure. communicate that to the audience. Especially it's a great selling point. It is yeah. because a lot, we have to remember, like all of us in this room are fitness fanatics. We like to work out, but mm -hmm. not most people are like that. Most yeah. people are like, how, what's the least amount I can do to get the most amount of return from yeah. it? And yeah. letting them know that it's like investing. You invest, so the, the more you put in now, it gets better and better because as you get older, you don't have to do as much to maintain what you've built. Compound interest. Yeah, yeah. I love That's that. Right. Yeah, That's right. Totally. It's so awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. I knew I'd love you on the show. Oh, so this is awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. It's been such a great thank time you so hanging much. out with you guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible Six pack, can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.